Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging channel. Tonight's session is on resolving double stars with backyard gear and Cliff Ashcraft is going to cover that. But before we jump into that, I am going to hand it over to Dylan O'Donnell who's in the room and who has won our image of the week and uh, I'm going to pass it to him and I see his image right there. So Dylan, I clicked on you, they can see your image, jump right into it. Uh, cool, Adam. Thanks so much, uh, you guys, for choosing this for Image of the Week. Um, this is one of our great southern objects, the Great Carina Nebula. Um, it's probably about four times, at least four times bigger than Orion, bigger and brighter. Um, it really is massive in the sky, um, easily discernible with the naked eye. So uh, with my particular wide field setup with the Hyperstar imaging at F2, um, it really makes it easy and, and, and fits in perfectly with this sort of, four, uh, I think it's 540 millimeter focal length. Um, and it even barely scrapes in, it sort of scrapes over the top. But this is only one and a half hours total integration. So uh, one hour of that's just on the RGB, taken with a um, one-shot color CCD camera. And then I just mixed in uh, a luminance layer of um, hydrogen alpha for about 30 minutes. And I did this last year as well, um, and I thought it was great last year, but I've learned so much in the last uh, year through watching um, this channel particularly, and making the jump over to Pix Insight and getting things a bit better, um, particularly with this object, just star reduction to really bring out the, the detail in those, um, in those dust clouds. So yeah, thanks again. No problem, thank you for sharing, and I'll remind everyone out there, um, feel free to share your images with us, and we will, uh, put you in consideration for the image of the week. Uh, we're doing most of our sharing right now on Facebook because they make it easier to share images. Uh, I wanted to mention this to a few of the people in the room. I didn't get a chance, but um, if you have an image and you're not on Facebook uh, and you can't find that thread, uh, the, what the heck's it called? I don't even remember what the, heck's, what the heck it's called, but uh, just uh, share your image with the Astro Imaging channel and I will see it. And then I will either get it into the right place or just consider it while it's up there. At least it'll, you'll be sharing it with us, and I can reshare it, and everyone will see it. So uh, that's probably the best method for uh, for that. But uh, right now I'm going to hand it right over to Cliff, who's going to uh, start his presentation. There you go, Cliff. Okie doke. Uh, get a little start here. I've been an amateur astronomer for quite a while. And this is not my first uh, uh, effort in double star observation. I was quite active back in the 2005-2008 uh, era and published a paper on my observations in the Journal of Double Star Observations. But I had not been active in the last few years, although I kept touch with what was going on by uh, uh, reading the comments on uh, Uncle Rod's uh, uh, Yahoo group binary stars uncensored and uh, in September of last year I noticed a number of very uh, active uh, discussions going on uh, centered around a fellow named uh, Russ Genet who's a professor at Cal Poly and some of his associates who were working on trying to get speckle interferometry working for amateur astronomers and they were very excited about new developments in CMOS sensor technology. Um, in particular, there was a new camera that was made available by ZW Optical called the ASI-224MC. And they were speculating that the noise levels, the read noise levels in this particular camera, and the sensitivity were such that uh, what was heretofore required a you know, $14,000 camera, an, an electron multiplying CCD camera, and a two meter class telescope might become something that an amateur could do in his backyard. Well, this immediately got my attention because I happened to own an ASI 224 MC and I had been using it successfully for several months for planetary imaging. So I jumped into the conversation and I volunteered that uh, I'd be happy to test this. They were all getting ready to present a paper at uh, a symposium in Barcelona, uh, Barcelona, Spain, the double star, multiple star conference. 
that uh, they were proposing that these new CMOS cameras be tried out for this purpose. So I'm all ready to try it out. So they hooked me up with David Rowe, who had a uh, computer program that did all the necessary Fourier transform mathematics to uh, work on uh, speckle images. And uh, uh, they gave me a list of uh, doubles to look at. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, within about a month or so, uh, we had enough information that they could change their paper over to a wow this works kind of a paper rather than a speculation paper and uh, a couple of publications in the Journal of Double Star Observation. So uh, without any further ado, let me get into my presentation. Um, uh, let, let me see here. If I just make, uh, can you see that uh, Adam? Not yet. Uh, nope, not yet. Um, hover over the left side and the green box screen share. No. Let's see. Let me get over. There we go. Okay. Screen share. And then uh, I forget what your computer calls it. Um, not full screen. Desktop, I believe. Can you see that? Now I see it. Okay, well I will launch it. Uh, can you see the uh, full screen version of the of the uh, slideshow? I believe I am. Yes. Okay. No. Well, this is a talk that I first gave uh, in March at Lowell Observatory for the Coconino Astro Astronomy Club, and my colleagues. Uh, from Arizona, including Rush A and the other guys involved in that Barcelona talk, and I recently gave it at NEF. But uh, this is the version for tonight. This is speckle interferometry of double stars from my backyard observatory. Well, first thing you may want, uh, you might want to know, of people who are mostly involved in deep sky imaging and things of this sort, why bother with double stars in the first place? Well, they orbit each other in accordance with Kepler's laws, and if you observe them over a long enough period of time, you can determine their orbital periods, and from their orbital periods and their distant distance, you can effectively weigh the stars. The mass of stars is fundamental to any astrophysical understanding of how stars work. And here's a simplified version of Kepler's law showing the mass of a star is equal to the square of its semi-major axis of its orbit divided by the cube of the period. Cliff? It, yes, sir. You know, I am not seeing your slideshow as it flips through. Uh, are, you, are you still on your title page, or are you on the second slide right now? I'm on about the, I'm on the second slide. Yeah, so I haven't, I'm not seeing this. I must be looking at your other presentation view. Uh, now I, I see know what I'm, I'm, now I, I will see go up here to the green screen thing again, and I will say, uh, Share the whole desktop? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. Entire screen. Yes. There we go. Okay. So you were... All right. Now I'll go back. That's the right spot. And I will say... There we go. That's now right. There we go. Okay. Now uh, I got to the point of this equation. And the, this is the mass of the star in solar mass units and the um, semi-major axis in astronomical units and the period in years uh, and you can just get that directly from the period. So uh, measuring the, uh, determining the orbits of binary stars is a fundamental astrophysical uh, activity and uh, uh, it's a good thing to do. Now here's a typical visual binary star system with a period of 87.7 years uh, it was first discovered in 1778 by William Herschel. Uh, uh, we might know it um, more commonly as 70 Ophiuchi, but us double star observers use the Washington double star catalog number uh, or the discoverer uh, identification. This was um, uh, this was first measured by uh, uh, by Struve. And it's uh, basically his notebook, 2272 uh, uh, entry. And it's 16.6 light years away. 
Well, presently, the separation of, uh, of, of these two components of the double star is 6.2 arc seconds, and this is the position angle measured from the north down here. Can you see my cursor? Yes, we can. Okay. This is the position angle, or theta, as double star observers call it. Well, uh, this orbit is very well determined, and we understand a lot about this star, but waiting 87 years to determine an orbit takes a long time. The period and the separation are related, and at typical stellar distances, binaries with wide separations have periods lasting hundreds of years. Life is too short to get much information from them. The closer they are, the shorter the periods, you get more bang for the buck observing very close binary stars. It takes less time to get the data to compute an orbit. But the trouble is, the closer they are, the harder they are to observe. Atmospheric turbulence limits the resolving power of Earth-based telescopes. That's why we put the Hubble in orbit. Now, if binaries are much closer than one second of arc, they are almost impossible to measure by conventional techniques, and the problem is worse for large aperture telescopes. Speckle interferometry is a technique that allows you to observe doubles that are much closer together than one can normally observe because of atmospheric turbulence. Well, what is it? Well, it's a way to observe, observe double, two, double stars that are too close. Uh, the atmospheric turbulence breaks up a star image into a rapidly changing blob of points called speckles, each one of which is an image of the star formed by a sub-aperture lenslets of air called Fried cells. And anybody that's ever looked at a star with, a micro, with an eyepiece that's way above the useful magnification has seen these things. It's a messy blob. You don't see the diffraction image of the star at all. You just see a scatter, scattering of, of twinkles. Now, although you can't see it, all of the information about the separation and position angle of a double star is present in these speckles, and you can extract it if you use a lot of math and computer processing. Now, this could normally, uh, uh, wait a minute, where did that go? I lost my, uh, there we go. Um, this could normally uh, only be done with uh, uh, very expensive cameras, two-meter class telescopes, and mainframe computers, and it was all way out of the reach of amateur astronomers. Now, here's how speckle interferometry works. Here's a typical close binary star. Uh, this one is uh, BU385AB, discovered by S.W. Burnham. And uh, it has a theta, or position angle, of 85 degrees, and a row, or separation, of 0.63 arc seconds. And this would be an extremely difficult star to observe, uh, unless you had very, very, very good seeing. Uh, what you should see, uh, for if the telescope were in orbit, would, would be these two uh, diffraction patterns uh, not overlapping, and if you got that image, you could measure it perfectly well. But, in fact, what you actually see is this. This is a pattern of speckles uh, uh, about that, uh, that blob in the middle uh, is really the, the, the image of the... Of the two components of that double star, but all of the information about the separation is in there. Uh, what you do in speckle interferometry is you compute the discrete two-dimensional Fourier transform of each frame of a set of a few thousand images, and you square that to get the um, uh, modulus squared of the uh, uh, of the Fourier transform. This has the amplitude in it, and you average that over all of the images you take, and that gives you something called the power spectral density. And if you look at this closely, you can see that that looks like there's some fringes uh, this direction, perpendicular to the line between the two stars. But it would be kind of difficult to get it out. Well, what you do is you just take the inverse Fourier transform, and this converts it into something that 
looks like, but isn't really an image. This is the autocorrelogram that you get out of speckle interferometry. And if I now make another version of that first diagram we had here, we see that there are there is an ambiguity. You don't know whether theta is this angle or all the way around. There's a 180 degree phase ambiguity, but you have a very accurate measure of the separation. This is point six five arcs or six three arc seconds apart. Very easy to measure in the uh, and it always derived from horrible looking images like that. Well how did the professionals do this? First of all you apply for a grant to get this uh, to buy a fourteen thousand dollar to fifty thousand dollar electron multiplied CCD camera. You get in line for an act for access to a two meter class telescope obtain access to a mainframe computer, hire a postdoc who remembers what the Fourier transform is and who can write Fourier Fortran programs, then you assign a team of graduate students to learn how to attach the fancy camera to the telescope, calibrate it, take thousands of very short exposure images, they typically use less than 10 milliseconds of each close binary star you want to measure, and save the image files to big reels of magnetic tape to take to the postdoc who is still struggling with Fortran format errors. When the program is not too buggy, read the data tape, compute 2D Fourier transform of each image, modulus squared, get the power spectral density, average over all the images, take the inverse Fourier transform to create the autocorrelogram, and do that for every one of the binary stars you've measured. Um, publish, write theses, apply for a grant for a more expensive camera. And this is pretty much the process, way out of reach of an amateur astronomer. Um, much of the work was done by the professionals at the U.S. Naval Observatory working with Brian Mason. Well, there's been some changes. The, the advances in uh, consumer electronics in both sensors and computers ha uh, has created a huge consumer market, about six billion dollars worth market for digital sensors. This motivates corporations to invest in charge couple devices and CMOS sensors for digital signal and reflex cameras as well as webcams, surveillance cameras, and cameras and smartphones. Emerging sensor technologies seem to be based on CMOS sensors. CCDs are mature. And uh, you can expect to see uh, this happen for deep sky imaging soon also. Uh, fierce competition brings rapid technological advances and drives the prices down to the point that you can get low cost ZW optical cameras with these sensitive and low noise Sony CMOS sensors. That, uh, that ASI 224MC costs only $359. Uh, not much more than a webcam would cost. Computer technology is also important. Uh, the availability of powerful personal computers, multi-core, high speed, huge storage space, and most importantly, we have a cadre of advanced amateur astronomer programmers with user groups who have developed powerful programs for lucky image uh, selection, stacking enhance and enhancement, as well as efficient image capture and advanced image processing. Guys like Cor Barabots who gave us uh, Registax, Emil Kralkamp who gave us Autostacker, Torsten Edelman who gave us Fire Capture, which is the best darn video capture program I've ever operated, and of course David Rowe who developed the Speckle Toolbox that I use to process these interferograms, and many more. Uh, um, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, and the best part about it is that these programs are free. Uh, this resulted in uh, uh, advanced research areas that were formerly the exclusive province of professionals are now open to amateur astronomers. High quality planetary imaging that took a space probe to get 20 years ago speckle interferometry, and a whole lot more. Look at these two images of Jupiter. 
They both show a lot of detail. The, the first one, though, was taken in 2001 by the Cassini spacecraft that was only 10 million miles from, uh, from Jupiter. The one on the right I got from my backyard with an 11-inch telescope. And I was 500 million miles away at the time. And uh, this is with uh, CMOS technology of today. Here's my observatory. Uh, in fact, it's the entire research staff of Perrineville Observatory. Uh, I'm the astronomer, instrument ma maker, and janitor, and that's my night assistant and head of security, Boomer. Um, here's the setup I use for speckle interferometry. In fact, it is identical to my setup for high-resolution planetary imaging. It's built around a Celestron C11 Edge uh, uh, telescope. Uh, F10 prime focus uh, on a fork uh, mount on a wedge. Uh, I have um, an all-important accessory here is my video finder with a 70 millimeter f1.8 lens on it uh, and in one of my older uh, video cameras. This is to help me get these uh, very faint uh, obscure double stars onto the very tiny uh, CMOS sensor of the camera. And of course here is my main camera which is the ASI 224MC sitting behind a 3x Barlow lens so I'm, I'm working at effectively about f, f30 in this uh, uh, you need very long focal ratio to see these speckles. Um, the setup uh, is essentially identical to my planetary imaging uh, but there's one big difference. For speckle interferometry or any kind of double star astronomy, you need to calibrate the camera, figure out what the camera rotation angle is and what the image scale is. And this is not something where you can just do a plate solve because typically you will have just the double star in the field of view because of the very long uh, focal ratio. Here are some ways you can do it. You can measure known double stars you can use a coarse diffraction grading or you can use drift image analysis and I'll tell you how to do all three of them. First of all you take a known double star. Uh, this particular double star is WDS19307 plus 2758 otherwise known as STFA43AB. You might know it as Alberio. Uh, it has a uh, position angle of 54 degrees and a separation of 35.4. So if you take an image of Alberio using uh, uh, either a, a short exposure CCD exposure or uh, lucky imaging like I do for planets and get an image like this, you can then use um, um, photometric tools like uh, in uh, Maxim DL and compute the centroids of these two stars. Here's the X and the Y centroids and get the delta X and delta Y uh, in pixels. Recognize we have a triangle and the uh, Pythagorean formula. You can get the distance between the two stars as the square root of delta X squared plus delta Y squared. In this case it's 399.10 pixels. Well, the plate scale, which is uh, E in the software I'm using, is just the, um, the known spacing of 35.4 arc seconds divided by this 39.10 pixels comes out to 0 0.0887 seconds of arc per pixel. Now, the uh, uh, position, uh, the camera angle comes about simply because you can compute this angle theta by just taking the arc tangent of delta x divided by delta y and this is 40.80 degrees and you get the camera angle from that just by uh, subtracting uh, the theta for Alberio and the camera angle in this case is minus 13.2 degrees. Well this this works but it's kind of frowned upon by the professionals because it's not a primary calibration and you really need an absolute technique. Uh, one which uh, I used a lot back in the days when I was uh, measuring double stars 
with my ST8 CCD camera is a coarse diffraction grating. This is a diffraction grating literally made out of wood that I slip over the aperture of the telescope. It's a series of bars a half an inch wide with half inch spacing in between them. And if you put a narrow band interference filter on your telescope uh, in front of your camera, you can get these um, uh, spectra with uh, multiple high orders. Um, uh, the zero order spectrum is right here. Uh, first order on either side, third order on either side. And by the way, when you have equal spaces and obstructions, uh, you suppress all of the even orders. So you simply measure the distance between these orders in, in um, um, pixels. And from this formula here, you can calculate what the uh, uh, scale factor of your uh, image is. Now, unfortunately, this method does not give you the um, uh, camera angle. And it has another problem in that uh, the filters that you buy are not exactly centered on H-alpha. They just include the H-alpha line. And stars have H-alpha absorption, so it's hard to know what the effective wavelength of each one of those spots is. You can do it better with a laser artificial star if you've got enough real estate to, uh, to do it on. Uh, a far better method, though, is drift calibration. In this particular one, you point it, your telescope at a, uh, a fairly bright star, position it off to the side of your screen, and turn off the uh, drive of your uh, telescope and allow the star to drift across the field of view. Now, while it's doing this, you're taking many, many short exposures. I take FITS files, and uh, I'm not taking a video. I'm taking individual FITS files. And uh, this sequence of FITS files becomes the input to the drift analysis tool in the Speckle Toolbox, again, programmed by David Rowe. Uh, this particular tool uh, allows you to make a fit of x against time. You get the slope of this, dx dt. y against time. You get the slope dy dt. And from this, you can directly calculate the um, 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 image scale. Uh, if you know the declination of the star that you're that you're observing. Similarly, you also get a fit of x versus y, and the slope of this line here is just the tangent of the camera angle. Well, this is all incorporated into the uh, uh, screen of the program, and once you put the declination of the star in here, you directly read off your camera angle and your image scale, in this case, 0 0.08694. And this is both easy and accurate. And uh, I do this before every run of uh, uh, double star measurements and again at the end just to check to see that something hasn't moved. Uh, it's an absolute method. It depends only upon the rotation of the Earth and it's pretty easy to do thanks to this nice piece of software that Dave wrote. Here's my work process for imaging doubles. I plan the targets for the night run from the Washington Double Star Catalog. I look at the right ascension and declination of the star, the last measured values of theta, rho, etc. And I run these, these particular pieces of software on the computer. I have my uh, targets, target data, uh, in an Excel spreadsheet, and I also enter the time of capture, exposure, etc., into the spreadsheet. I use Fire Capture for operating the main camera, the ASI 224MC. I have the remote focus software running because uh, uh, remote focus is critical. Uh, you you need to be able to get a very good focus, and operating a manual focus is a real pain if you have to go back and forth between the computer and the telescope and everything is vibrating. So I use the Botter steel drive, but there are many other good ones. Uh, 
I'm running IC Capture to operate that DMK21 video finder camera and there's a nifty little free piece of software called Owl's Reticule written by someone down in Australia which is basically just a little crosshair overlay that you can put on top of any screen, any window on your computer. And I use the Guide 9 Planetarium program because it has a very good database of multiple uh, star catalogs in it, which is a great help for finding the reference stars that I need for deconvolution. I also then do a drift calibration using fire capture and a convenient bright star. Now, getting the speckle data, go to the coordinates of the target star in the planetarium program. Identify the target by right-clicking on it and reading the info screen. I then use the telescope hand control to go to the star's coordinates and identify the, con uh, the target by comparing the video finder screen with what I see in the planetarium uh, using my gestalt and the star patterns. I use the hand control to center the target on the owl's reticule's crosshairs and then I find the star on the full screen of ca fire capture. Set the, re the region of interest to 256 by 256 pixels or smaller. Uh, this is basically just to uh, let me capture more frames and occupy less memory space in the computer. I get about a 25% saturated histogram. You don't want to oversaturate the bright speckles because that's where most of the information is. I routinely capture 10,000 images in FITS format of the target and I identify a suitable reference star very close to the target star and uh, I uh, uh, and this is why it's critical to have a good star catalog you, this has to be a single star you don't want to use a reference star which is a double star I go to it and acquire 2000 FITS files of the reference star I'm going to use that for deconvolution later now this is the very messy screen that's on my uh, observatory computer. In the background here you can see the Excel spreadsheet. Uh, the red screen, this is uh, fire capture. You can see, I, I actually believe it or not, there's a star in the middle. That's a very dispersed speckle pattern. And uh, I've got the histogram at about 25%. You can see my planetarium program in the background. Uh, the target is that little star right there. See this grouping around it? Here's my video finder screen. There's that grouping of stars and there's the target. Uh, this is the controller for the video uh, uh, finder camera. There's my uh, Botter Steel Drive uh, focuser controller, up and down focus. And uh, This is a blow up of the uh, region around the target with the information about the target, including the fact that that is a double star and it's the one I'm looking for. Uh, TDT3890 is the is a double star I'm trying to measure. Uh, this is a close up of the video finder screen, and that little tiny dot there is what I what I'm wanting to get the 10,000 images of. So. Uh, I, I, I use the drift calibration tool to determine the image scale. I make FITS cubes, which are basically just a box that has uh, uh, a thousand FITS in it. I make ten of the target, uh, one of the reference star with two thousand FITS in it. And I use the process FITS cube to, uh, tool on all eleven cubes at once to do all of that math. Uh, do the 2D discrete Fourier transform of each FITS file in the cube and get the modulus squared, etc. All of this very hairy math happens completely in the background and you don't see it going at all. Now, there's a speckle reduction tool to actually make the measurements of the uh, theta and the rho. Uh, you put the uh, power spectral density files of the target star and the reference star, view the fringes of the interferogram, adjust some high and low pass filters, and use the astrometry tool to extract the theta and rho.
Uh, here is a typical uh, uh, autocorrelation diagram from a, a star. Uh, you notice I have the, um, it's COU37 is the target star. My reference star is TYC1270-1378. And this is very, this what happened to be very close to the target star. And I acquired it right after I got the 10,000 frames to make the seeing as similar as possible. So I am deconvoluting the target with 27% of the uh, uh, full intensity of that reference star. And these are the uh, Gaussian low pass uh, filter settings, 35 pixel radius. This is basically a set it and forget it. It's determined by the resolution of your telescope. But this one is very critical, and t it takes a lot of fiddling to, to get a recognizable and measurable uh, autocorrelogram. And uh, this uh, pressing this uh, green um, uh, target brings up the astrometry screen. And uh, you can see that it has already picked one of these and has measured the uh, theta as 265.518 degrees, and that is 0.4644 arc seconds, less than a half an arc second apart. And this was from an image that you couldn't even see a star on if you when it, while it was being captured. Now I tabulate the results in my spreadsheet, compute averages, standard uh, deviations and <clears throat> communicate it with fellow double star enthusiasts. Use the Yahoo group, publish papers in the Journal of Double Star Observations, and give talks about it. Uh, here's uh, a, a typical uh, couple of stars that I've observed to show you what kind of uh, accuracy I get. This was one that didn't work. Uh, this is what the autocorrelogram looked like. This is what the lucky image of it looked like. I can see it's a double, but there's nothing to measure. And the reason is that these are 0.35 arc seconds apart. You cannot beat the uh, diffraction limit of your telescope. You can just beat the seeing. So this is an example of something that's too close to measure with an 11-inch telescope. On the other hand, these are two autocorrelograms with lucky images that went with them. Uh, the lucky images let me know that I should measure the theta here, not here. And uh, this one, it's on that side. That's the smaller star. But if you look at the um, uh, standard deviations, I've uh, computed the rectilinear component, uh, components, x and y. Uh, I'm getting the uh, uh, positions of these things to within 0 0.05 arc seconds. So the measured uh, separation is 0.65 plus or minus 0.06. The theta was 313.3 plus or minus 1.47. Similar result on this STF2606AB uh, uh, with even better precision on it. Uh, when the professionals saw the results that I was getting with this inexpensive camera and 11-inch telescope, they were essentially blown away by it, that, uh, that I could get this kind of precision on something less than a half arc second across. And uh, they're, they're, they're quite faint. I think this was only a tenth magnitude one. Uh, tabulate the data. Uh, I've gotten, uh, this is about a third of the output at the point where I wrote my uh, my uh, uh, paper. Uh, on a good night, I can image and measure anywhere from five to seven double stars. And this is a kind of a summary of, of uh, maybe about two-thirds of what I've done now. Uh, there's a absolute floor at 0.4 arc seconds. I can't get below that because that's the diffraction limit of my uh, telescope. And I've got a wall here at about 11th magnitude. And that's a combination of the sensitivity of the camera, the aperture of the telescope, and the light pollution in New Jersey, where I observe from. So I'm getting down to almost 11th magnitude. 
and I'm routinely getting well under a half an arc second of, uh, of uh, separation on the doubles. And you know, this is stuff that used to take a, a fourteen to fifty thousand uh, dollar camera and uh, a, a telescope that only professionals would have access to. Uh, papers that have come out of this already, besides uh, the conference at Barcelona where they reported my data, we have a multiple author paper here, which they, uh, since I've supplied the data, they, they put me on the author list. Uh, and a picture of my telescope and this uh, very close double. Uh, in addition to that, there's a paper that I published by myself with all of my results uh, showing a correlation between my measurement of theta, the last reported in the WDS values, uh, the my measurements of rho, last reported values, and some of my uh, autocorrelograms compared with lucky images uh, using the same techniques I use for uh, high resolution planetary imaging. Uh, accomplishments, uh, that's my old paper in 2006 uh, in which I made over 300 double star measurements and I've got 20 newly discovered doubles with ACA discover ID. This is the real way to get a star named after you rather than using the star registry, uh, contributed speckle observation result to that Barcelona symposium, co-author on that uh, group paper, and my own paper. And I've measured, uh, this is now up to about 80 close doubles using speckle interferometry. Uh, I've got another couple of papers in the works. And uh, a promise of things to come, uh, by spectrum analysis, uh, which offers a promise of actually giving high resolution images by the same kind of techniques that speckle interferometry does. The by spectrum transform is the third order big brother to the Fourier transform and it eliminates the 180 degree phase ambiguity. Uh, this is a lucky image of Mars from the 2014 opposition and this is the by spectrum image from the same data that was used to compute that. Uh, it's not very good, uh, but you can you can rec at least recognize Sirtis Major and uh, uh, Mari Samarium on it. And uh, I have hopes that we're going to be getting uh, high quality images in poor seeing uh, that, that uh, of, of the planets. So this is basically uh, the talk. Any questions? Well, I have a few of my own, but before I start asking questions, I'm just going to invite everyone out there to type their questions into Q&A. Um, and I, I hope you guys know where to find it. I think you guys do at this point. Um, yeah, I was going to ask about the I, what I think you're referring to as the 180-degree phase ambiguity. Um, yep. why, why? I may not understand the answer, but why that limitation? And I guess bi-spectrum is working past it, but... I, I don't quite understand why you'd have that ambiguity. It happens when you compute the modulus squared of the Fourier transform. Uh, when you do that, you lose phase information entirely. And you cannot get the autocorrelogram unless you do the modulus squared. Okay. So it, it, it's fundamental to the, 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 the process of, uh, of getting the uh, interferogram. And it's unfortunate, but uh, uh, generally it's not a problem because most of these stars have a history and uh, they may have been measured uh, once by the, uh, the team at the Naval Observatory so you know which side of the primary, the secondary, is on and uh, you know roughly where it should be. And of course, uh, since I do planetary imaging, I routinely get a lucky image of everything and even though it's not quite good enough to uh, uh, get accurate measures, at least it tells me which side the secondary is on. Yep. So it doesn't quite matter because you really could, you really do know yep. in almost every case you'd be imaging. If um, it's a brand new discovered star, uh, a double star, and you don't have uh, the ability to resolve it by lucky imaging. There are other techniques which I don't completely understand yet, but uh, um, there are techniques that the professionals have used in the past to 
uh, unambiguously tell which side it's on. But still, the, the Washington Double Star Catalog is full of quadru quadrature errors. So they've made mistakes doing it, too. Hmm. And you're sampling at 0 .0887 seconds per pixel. Exactly. Yeah, so that's way down there. And uh, I'll back up my question with that. Um, you went over the three methods for determining the, ro the angle and the separation. Um, was it angle and separation, I believe? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but it seems to me like if you're actually trying to resolve the close, anything close where it's just blurred by the seeing, that drift calibration is really the only method. Exactly. Yeah. That's yeah, the it. first the first method you would just see a blur, so you wouldn't. It's not like you're going to be looking at Alberio, and um, you're going to be looking at a really close double. So first method wouldn't necessarily work. Or I forget why the second method would, wouldn't work for that. But well, you, well you, you you could actually use Alberio. The only purpose for that is to determine what the camera angle is and what the plate scale is. And you can get oh, okay. a perfectly good plate scale and camera angle using that. The only thing wrong with that is that it's not an absolute method. And uh, there are enough uh, really nearly stationary double stars in, uh, scattered around the sky that you could do that. And, but the, the professionals kind of frown on it and they really would prefer you had an absolute method. The only thing wrong with the, the diffraction method, other than the a little bit of uh, uncertainty about exactly what wavelength is in the center of each one of those blobs, is that it does not give you the camera angle. It gives you the, the plate scale, but not the camera angle. But the drift method uh, gives you both, and it's quite precise. And that's right in the toolbox. The uh, yep. yep. So that sounds like the program to download if you're if you're planning on doing this stuff and um, I did have a third question let me see here um, oh yeah have you I'm curious as to how many of your sub exposures you would toss do you toss many of them or do you keep most of them for all the data you keep uh, all of them all of them that's the that's the beauty of this, and that's what is the the real promise of this uh, bispectrum method. It's not lucky imaging. The, mm -hmm. the the you take the scattered speckles as they are, and that and the speckles have the information about the separation and the position angles. Similarly, they have all the information of the image in it. If you could get it without uh, the phase ambiguity, you would be able to reconstruct a perfectly good image from all of those messy speckled things. All right. So my my follow-up question on that or maybe I'll, I'll say it, if the limitation of your of what you can resolve basically is the limit of your telescope, uh, the diffraction limit of your telescope, then using something like an infrared filter to get past seeing isn't going to do much for you. It, you're That's basically you're basically That's, pushing the telescope to its theoretical limit. Right. It's as though my telescope were in orbit, literally. Yeah. That's that's amazing. In fact, there might be a benefit of, of going to shorter wavelength. I mean, instead of using red, use blue. I haven't tried it, but uh, uh, I, what I, the, the, uh, the ASI 224MC is a one-shot color camera. And I'm doing this in spite of the fact that I've got the Bayer filter matrix in the way. There's a new camera that was not available when I did this called the ASI 290MM, which is the uh, uh, an even smaller pixels, and it's a monochrome camera. Uh, and my colleagues uh, have obtained one of these. And uh, well, I actually got one loaned to me by Sam Wen of ZWO, and I tried it out, and it works just fine. So. The, these new inexpensive uh, CMOS cameras are just amazing. Yeah. And uh, Bob B, uh, I don't know if that's Bob Buckheim, I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, he says, great show, and uh, just basically asked the same question I did. Uh, do you use a filter for your spectral imaging, uh, images, uh, V-band or other? And I think your answer was no. With, well, you answer that. Well, I, I did not. Uh, in this particular case, I was simply taking raw 
8-bit undebayered uh, data and uh, using it as though it were monochrome, and it worked. Uh, th there's uh, things to be gained by uh, using uh, different filters. For example, uh, in my earlier work back in 2005 or so, uh, I used an ST8, and I used a set of three filters. I used the V, the R, and the I filter of the standard photometric set, and I computed um, uh, the the rho and the theta from the average of 12 measurements in each of uh, with with four uh, measurements on each filter and I got delta magnitudes in in each filter color this delta magnitude through different filters is a very useful thing for double star astronomy and uh, uh, we would like to be able to do that uh, uh, in um, uh, with the a speckle interferometry as well. Uh, it's turning out though that it's uh, very difficult to get delta magnitudes from the autocorrelograms and this is the big reason why we're pushing the bispectrum. Uh, it's not so I can get uh, images of Mars in lousy seeing, it's so we can get delta magnitudes in different color filters for the professional double star astronomers. Cool and I just uh, pulled up the specifications of the Edge HD 1100. I used an 8 inch, but I wanted to see the uh, the uh, Rayleigh limit and the Dawes limit. Dawes limit is 0. 0.42 arc seconds, and the Rayleigh is 0. 0.5. And you were right at 0. 0.4, correct? Yep, exactly. Yeah. So. Uh, and and I, I tried for 1.35, and I could get an indication that it was a double, but I couldn't measure it. Mm hmm. I forget. I always forget that saying, something about uh, in theory every. Uh, I'm gonna have to look it up because I, I love the saying and I always forget it. But in theory, everything works in theory, and but in reality, it doesn't. But this is one of those cases where you're basically right up against the theory behind it, yep. and uh, kind of confirming that the theory is is somewhat correct. Yep. That is uh, that is very cool. If I get a really dark night and go past 11th magnitude, I get a beer from Russ Janae, though. So I bet he might eventually get it, but I haven't so far. <laughs> awesome. I've got a quick question. So though I, have a, <clears throat> I fully understand that the, uh, the show is just talking about how to split binary stars, but one of the questions that I have, and I'm a little bit curious because you did bring up El Barrio right at the very beginning, and uh, I'd read a... Uh, a paper a little while ago that they had thought that El Barrio wasn't necessarily a true binary star system, that it just might be a visual star system, a visual binary system. And I'm wondering if that these methodologies can be used to determine whether or not the binary star that we are in fact observing are truly binary systems or are there additional factors that we must take into consideration um, to make that determination? Well, th th this is... Uh, th th this is a critical thing to do whether you're doing speckle interferometry or conventional uh, imaging or even using a filer micrometer like Struve did uh, you have to see whether the, uh, the whether there's any motion at all I mean there are some systems that are uh, just happen to be in the line of sight and there's very little proper motion of either one of them uh, but in in the case of that uh, uh, 70 Ophiuchi, of course, there is a very well uh, described 87.7 uh, year orbit to that. Uh, in the case of Alberio, uh, it, it is not moving very fast at all, which is convenient if you want to use it as a, uh, a standard for separation and uh, camera angle, but uh, it just takes a long time to determine. Uh, there are many uh, doubles that are common proper motion pairs. They may be things that were associated with the same uh, star cluster when they were originally formed and they're just sort of drifting along but there's no uh, orbital relationship between them or they may just be uh, line of sight and I'm not sure whether uh, it's really known what, uh, what kind Alberio is right now. Uh, Very cool. I mean, 
So. so with that said then, have you been able to observe any binary star motion then? So can you see the actual orbits changing just based on um, the angles, or sorry, the camera angles that are being used to measure it? Well, uh, uh, I, I can maybe show you a little, little better here. Uh, the, these are some very close uh, double stars that I measured and reported in my paper. You notice that this uh, is uh, not a straight line. There's some deviation of these uh, uh, rows from the last uh, reported value in the double star catalog. So I think I am seeing motion uh, in my measurements compared to the last reported values. Now, I, I'm quite sure that if I come back next year and measure the same ones, I'm going to see uh, additional motion. Th that's the reason for doing these very, very close binaries, because they move rapidly enough that you can accumulate orbital data within your lifetime. You don't have to go back to uh, stars that were first observed by William Herschel and uh, work out the orbit over, you know, with a couple of generations worth of observers' data. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely fascinating. So then, the next question that I have, is just as it relates to that, because if you can measure the distance, so if the row value is constantly in flux, or at least based on these multiple observations that you have, and I'm not sure if I missed it during your um, your presentation, was how do you then account for the atmospheric um, uh, diffraction? Not diffraction. Is that the right term? Atmospheric turbulence is the term that I'm looking for then to determine what that distance is or is the centroid a fixed value that one can always measure based on a given brightness, if that makes sense. Well, Trying to formulate the question to be more articulate, sorry. Well, what, 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 you, what you do is you make a, a, a plot of the, um, the rectilinear X and Y data. Uh, you don't take the polar measurements uh, rho and theta. You, you get uh, rho tangent theta, or excuse me, rho sine theta and rho cosine theta converted into x and y form. And you plot that over the, the length of time that you've made observations. And if it is a true binary system, you will see a portion of an elliptical orbit. The, the, the star will actually be curving. In other words, this rho value is not just randomly changing, it's uh, it's either just drifting by linearly if it's uh, uh, if there's no relationship between the stars at all, uh, or uh, you will see some curvature indicating that uh, there's actually a, a binary system involved. So it's uh, you, you plot it, and there are guys in uh, the Naval Observatory and uh, amateurs who are associated with them who spend all their time uh, simply mining the data and computing these orbits and there's literally thousands and thousands of them where we have very good orbits determined and the very best orbits are the ones that are determined by speckle interferometry uh, rather than you know the old data with uh, pilar micrometers and and the like that is so cool I've got another question but if there's anyone else that wants to ask a question I'll just keep my mouth shut uh, unless, well, Hytham, go ahead. Uh, Bob Buckheim has another question, but it's slightly off, uh, off topic, slightly okay. off topic. All right, cool. So I'll just go ahead and ask that. So based on the, um, so by measuring or at least plotting or by measuring rho or by using that rho value, one can determine the orbit or the size of the orbit, but you can also determine how much it is fading in and out, but I guess the question that I have, and I'm just trying to articulate this properly, is can one use this data then to determine the mass of the star based on its orbit or determine how much gravity or how much push and pull it's going to have on its partner? Like what other data can we extract just based on that information that we have by taking a look at the orbit of these two binary stars? Well, you, you need the data on the distance, and of course we're getting lots and lots of very accurate parallax data from the Hipparchos, Sa uh, satellite and the new Gaia satellite. So if you know the distance and you know the orbital elements, you've got it all. Uh, okay, so we're, they're using trigonometric parallax then to determine that. Yes. That's and the if they're too the far away for okay. that, they will use other 
sneaky methods like the, uh, uh, the the brightness of the components, the spectral class, and things of that sort. And of course, from those, the data is uh, uh, less sure than if you have an accurate trigonometrical parallax. So with trigonometrical pa parallax, then, how many times do they you or how many times do they acquire the necessary data points? Because I know you could take one, say, in January, and then the other one in December, and then you would just take the two measurements from the opposing sides of our orbit, and then use that to determine what the angle is going to be, and that would end up giving us the distance. But are there additional factors that may end up throwing us off, or that may impact that? And how do we? Well, the, 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 uh, that's the way that it used to be done uh, based okay. upon Earth observations of the position of the star relative to the you know, essentially fixed background stars. But these, uh, the Hipparchos satellite and the Gaia satellite, they're just up there basically uh, spinning and scanning and they're continuously doing this uh, throughout their entire orbits. and. Uh, they're accumulating a tremendous amount of data, and it's uh, quite accurate. So it's uh, it's not just from the opposite sides of the Earth orbit. They're doing it constantly throughout the orbit. So uh, uh, I'm not completely I'm not completely sure of the exact way it's done, but it's it, you don't just uh, you you don't just do it on one star and then wait till you get on the other side of the orbit to do it again. They're continuously doing the whole sky. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you. Yep. And uh, Bob Buckheim's second question, uh, like I said, slightly off topic, but very uh, popular question. Uh, scope collimation, how do you do it? What's your method, and how often do you do it? Well, that's interesting. I've, uh, I've been just tickled with this Edge HD machine. I uh, I collimated it once when I set it up, and I uh, I, I used the procedure of uh, of uh, uh, getting uh, the uh, the out of focus inside and out of focus images uh, of of a star uh, absolutely concentric, and then I went to very very high magnification, uh, and uh, I was uh, Essentially, doing uh, I was doing lucky imaging on stars exactly in the center of the field, uh, trying to see any uh, slight uh, uh, tinge of out of out of center uh, diffraction patterns, and I got it as good as I could get it. I haven't touched it since then. I've had the telescope uh, in my observatory, sitting on the pier now for about. Uh, about three years, and uh, its collimation is fine. It's very stable, but I don't I don't haul it around in the trunk of my car either. Yeah, that's a definite benefit. Uh, every time you move it, you risk something. Although yeah. I I found the edges to be pretty stable myself too. Um, uh, I'm really pleased to be on uh, I got a text. It must be from Tolga because I know he doesn't have a mic. Uh, Dr. Mary Lou West is asking, uh, what about three or four star systems? It's, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, it's complicated. Uh, I, I have uh, 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 an autocorrelogram of uh, the trapezium in the uh, Orion Nebula. Let me see if I can... Uh, uh, if I can locate that and show you what it looks like. Uh, uh, basically, uh, if you take uh, all of the pairs of, uh, of stars in the system and write down what the autocorrelogram of that ought to look like and superimpose them all, that's what you get. And it's uh, it can be very complicated if... Uh, uh, if it's an unknown system and and you you don't really know what you're looking at, uh, let me see where do I have that? Hang on a second here. Uh, I think I have it on my website. 
I think I have the uh, um, image of double star observation. Wait for this to come up. In the case of Alberio, it was it was pretty uh, 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 obvious. No, I don't have it here. I don't have it here. Uh, uh, let's go on and, and, and have more discussion, and I will look for that, and I will, I will show it to you when I find it. Um, what are the... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm losing the terminology here. The, the fastest uh, period double stars, um, what kind of time length does it take for them to fully... Uh, rotate or orbit each other? Well, if you include things like neutron uh, star binary systems, they can rotate extremely rapidly. It depends entirely upon how compact the, star the stars are themselves and how close together they are. Uh, uh, when we're looking at, for example, these uh, uh, red dwarf stars with a hot Jupiter orbiting around it, it's kind of hard to tell that from a binary star by the way I look at it and they have orbits that are, are days and of course with the neutron stars uh, it's uh, uh, minutes or hours depending upon how close together they are. Well can you actually resolve those neutron no, stars? No, not me. <laughs> okay, I was gonna say wow you can do that. that... No, no, no way. No way. <laughs> I'm trying to find where I have the trapezium. So I'm, I'm wondering, with all these observations, have we ever seen uh, stellar collisions of any sort based on the data that has ever been gathered? So there, what was there, what? There, there was something that it was it was in the news uh, 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 last year, which uh, looked like it was a uh, 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 either a stellar collision or a star. Uh, it was a black hole, eta star. That's what it yeah. was. Yeah. guys out there while we give Cliff some time to browse his hard drive. Uh, make sure you ask your questions now. Um, it's been a really cool presentation. I, I'm still kind of amazed. A lot of us do, uh, most of us do pretty picture imaging and to be able to resolve details, now a lot of, we're not really doing, we're not really concentrating on the point source uh, stars so much as the nebula and the, the galaxies, but to uh, to resolve at that level, it's just really crazy. Maybe with well, enough I, processing power in the future, we'll be able to use that type of uh, technique to actually help us resolve nebula a little bit better. Well, I, I, I'm continually frustrated by seeing, since I do... Uh, 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 planetary imaging so much and uh, to be able to get resolution as though my telescope were in orbit is just just marvelous to me absolutely marvelous yeah that's what I absolutely love about using uh, the infrared filters because like you said during your presentation it really helps cut through all that seeing and it's amazing how much of a difference there is just from going from blue to green to red then to IR it's just a, a world of a difference in the amount of detail that you can resolve. Hi, Tim. Are you using infrared on deep sky stuff or just for planetary? I have bought an infrared filter. I just have yet to put it into my into my uh, filter wheel down at the observatory. So I, I can't wait. I'm looking forward to it. Because the 16803, it's super, super low on the scale when it comes to IR. So it's going to it's gonna be incredibly noisy. I'm not uh, all too optimistic. You know, I... I, I hate to be a wet blanket here, but I got the infrared filter from Astrodome. Yeah. Kind of nice emission nebula and didn't see a thing. <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't expect to see very much, but I just wanted to give it a shot. I figure why not, right? <laughs> 
Yeah, I my exact. So I, if you find something, let me know. Maybe I missed something. Uh, Cliff, I do have a question for you. This is Eric. Yeah. What are the lessons that we can take from that technique for our, say, uh, emission nebula imaging? Is there any, anything? I see you use it for planetary, so there must be some techniques that we could perhaps learn from this. Well, this is going to depend upon how uh, well the bispectrum tool gets developed. And uh, there's a big limitation there. You know what the isoplanetic patch is? It's a little tiny piece of sky where uh, the wave fronts of the, of the stars encounter a pretty much exactly the same uh, seeing condition. Well, the, uh, the bispectrum uh, imaging uh, will only be within that isoplanetic patch, and uh, that's uh, kind of discouraging uh, for um, uh, imaging big field things like... Uh, 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 like nebulae and star clusters and the like. Uh, it might be able to image uh, right in the middle of a, of a say, a, a tightly packed together stars in the middle of a globular star cluster, but you're not going to get uh, the Carina Nebula. It's just, it's just too big an object. Let's say if you were looking at the trapezium and you really wanted to hone in on that one area. Uh, that, well, that's what I'm trying to show you right now. Hang on just a minute, and uh, I will, uh, I will, uh, I will find that for you. Uh, where's my drive? I, I just, I just located the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, trapezium, and uh, there it is. There's the trapezium, and and by the way, you will get to see. Uh, the um, uh, process by which I uh, um, well, I screwed up there, didn't I? Ah, let me get rid of that. Excuse me, I forgot I didn't have a uh, I didn't have a reference star. Okay, here we go. This is the autocorrelogram of the trapezium. And if you look at uh, this, 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 and this, you can sort of see the trapezium there, right? And it's mirror image over here. Can you guys see what I'm looking at? Yes, we can. And uh, well, this this is a autocorrelogram of a quadruple star system. I mean, they're a little bit farther apart than I normally measure, but uh, the, the, all of the, uh, this distance here, this group here is that particular pair. This one is that particular pair. I think this, these things over here are those two. So it, it, imagine uh, let, let's say with three stars, you've got uh, three possible binary interactions. Uh, write down what you think the autocorrelogram for each one of those looks like and just superimpose them around the central star. And that will be what the autocorrelogram of the multiple star system looks like. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask a question that you kind of just touched on. Uh, you mentioned bispectral, uh, the bispectral method, but that's not what you're using here, correct? Uh, that's correct. I'm using uh, traditional uh, speckle interferometry, just like the professionals used to use on uh, with their big, expensive cameras and such. Uh, the the uh, bispectrum is in its infancy, and uh, I, I'm just tickled that we've got an image that good uh, from it. But uh, I, I think that. For getting images of things that are small enough that they fit inside of the isoplanetic patch of the seeing, uh, I, I'm 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 really hopeful for it, and that would be for for uh, double and multiple star systems and small planets. Jupiter's probably too big. Yeah, because I think from a previous uh, discussion, um, the the isoplanetic patch depends on the size of the cells 
but it could be as low as four arc seconds, I think, was what we discussed previously, which is very yep. small. Yeah, yeah, that's very small. I mean, the, 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 this image of Mars here is about, uh, I think, about 15 arc seconds at the time that that was done, and that's, that's pushing it. Mm -hmm. And Jupiter would definitely be yeah. over the line. By the way, this is the screen of the computer out in my observatory about 300 feet away. I, I'm using go to my PC, so I'm warm in the house, and I'm operating the, uh, uh, the uh, computer in the observatory. But you guys are used to that sort of thing. <laughs> but, uh, there's my, uh, there's my uh, camera that I will be uh, uh, imaging the Mercury transit tomorrow with. So. Yeah, did I? I, didn't, I wanted to mention that anybody with a solar scope, check that out tomorrow. Starting at about 7:30 a.m. and going well, if you're Eastern time, 7:30 a.m. to I think 2:30. Definitely worth checking out. Yep. Um, one more question for me. Uh, you said uh, I, I can see your focus. Uh, you're focusing right there, uh, and you're remotely focusing. But are you manually remotely focusing? Uh, I, 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 I'm not, I'm not running a, 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 an automatic focuser to minimize the FWHM. Uh, I have an up and a down button, and I look at the screen, <laughs> and okay. you know, it's like I'm turning the knob, but I'm doing it without making the telescope vibrate. Gotcha. Yeah, great presentation. This stuff is really cool. It's right. really, really insane what you could do with from your backyard. I, it's funny that the pros had to find an amateur to get the equipment to test out their theory. <laughs> I, I got a big kick out of it, and it's been—I uh, I literally haven't stopped running since uh, uh, since that happened. So every, every clear night, I'm out there, either lucky imaging planets or speckle interferometry on. Uh, on double stars, and and then when you add to that uh, what that uh, uh, what that we're doing uh, in cooperation with the Kelt program, and uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, Tolga has told you about our uh, uh, observing exoplanet transits. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's amazing what you can do in your backyard these days, or in the, or in the club's observatory. Mm -hmm. So all with these new CMOS sensors coming out of. Uh, ZWO. That's awesome. Yep. Yeah, I met Sam at uh, Sam Wen is a young uh, amateur astronomer who formed that company. I met him at Neef, a very pleasant guy, and he's extremely helpful. And you can't beat the price. My goodness. Yeah. A lot of us. Uh, well, I know a lot of the people in this room have really expensive uh, CCD cameras, <laughs> and. Uh, we look at uh, the cameras that they're putting out, including, is it the 1600? I think Tolga's testing it, actually. Yep. Um, and it's kind of insane. I've uh, got one coming in the mail, so I've ordered yeah. one. <laughs> you, you look at them and you shake your head because, uh, wow, the technology. I don't know how they make this stuff so reasonably priced. Well, the, 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 that's that $6 billion market I was telling you about. Yeah, yeah. And this drives a lot of technological advance, and uh, uh, it's great. We it's a great time to be an astronomer. Yep. Awesome. Well, uh, I haven't seen any questions from outside the room. Uh, Cliff, if you wanted to plug your club or plug anything, you're welcome to do it now before we uh, call it the end. Okay. Well, I'm a member of Amateur Astronomers Incorporated, along with Tolga, and uh, we have a uh, uh, an observatory that we operate on the campus of Union College in Cranford, New Jersey, with a 24-inch reflector, uh, a largely rebuilt Group 128 24-inch. It's now a Ritchie Crutchian, and a superb instrument now. It's go-to. We have our own 10-inch. Uh, uh, achromatic refractor, an F15 10 inch refractor, an airspace doublet that we built ourselves from scratch, including the lens. And we have a remote site out at Jenny, Jenny Jump State Park where we are currently operating a, uh, 
uh, a 14 inch uh, a C14 and we're probably going to be putting a C14 edge out to replace it. Uh, it's a good club. We have a monthly uh, meeting with an outside speaker uh, and every Friday night uh, uh, there's a meeting at the observatory with a, a, a talk and public viewing. Great club to belong to. I've been a member since 1964. Great. That's not your club that's selling the large, is it a Newtonian? I don't know if you've seen it. If you browse Craigslist for telescopes, someone out in New Jersey is selling a really big Newtonian with mount. It's not us. Not you guys. No. Nope. Must be another New Jersey club with a big, with a big cannon. Yeah. If anyone's looking for a, a huge Newtonian, check it out. I think it weighs two hundred and some pounds, though. So. With uh, uh, largely due to the efforts of Jim Nordhausen, one of our members. We've converted our Group 128 24-inch reflector into something that uh, uh, the computer can't tell it from a paramount. So we've got a we've got the paramount motors in it. So uh, we've got our 24-inch go-to telescope now, and it'll even track satellites. Mm -hmm. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Cliff, for a great presentation. Um, I uh, let me see. Uh, next week, Alex is going to follow up on part two of his uh, sensor sense uh, presentation, and um, I guess that's it for tonight. But uh, let remember uh, image of the week. Share it with either me on Google Plus or on our Facebook page. Uh, there was one other thing I wanted to cover, and what was it? Um, uh, I don't have anything scheduled for the following week, but we are going to try and get some more conversations going on. Uh, and I'm hoping to do less talking and more listening in the future. Um, because there's a lot of smart guys in this room, and uh, they have a lot of good stuff to say, but I've got to get them involved and when, when we're not doing a formal presentation. Um, there was something else, but I forget it. Uh, and I don't see it in my notes. But yeah, again, thank you. Uh, thank you, Cliff, for coming on. Thanks, everyone out there, for all your questions and everyone in the room as well. And, uh, well, we will see you next week. Okay. Thanks. It's been fun. Thank you.